Okay, we're going we're gonna to follow up with um, a discussion of what we started with on Tuesday, second hour, which is the um, question I, I posed to everybody, and everybody had some comment or question. What's the difference between a gas reservoir and an oil reservoir? And, um, and then if we can figure that out, uh, the next question is, you know, why does it make a difference? Okay. I mean, after all, gas and oil just seem like labels. And uh, the question is, does it have any real impact or not, whether we call it a gas reservoir or an oil reservoir? And as I mentioned to you, I worked for a couple of years on the uh, blowout, the Macondo um, Deepwater Horizon blowout uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And the fluids from that reservoir uh, were never really established to be oil or gas because the four samples that they collected from the reservoir f before the blowout, um, they all had, you know, were, looked very similar on paper, um, but the um, two of the samples measured uh, to be a bubble point, which would suggest an oil, and the other two samples measured um, a dew point of the mixtures, which would suggest that they were gas. So uh, sometimes you don't know. The question is, does it really matter? Um, the comments and the, some of the answers and questions that came out on Tuesday, th there were some very, I think, uh, correct and useful observations. I think some of the observations were, uh, were not you know, always the case, um, like gas reservoirs are found deeper at higher pressures and temperatures than oil reservoirs. That was something they were teaching the industry back in the 80s and 90s based on some, some publications, and it's not really it's not a general truth. Um, but then other people made observations that, well, oil reservoirs would have higher viscosity than gas reservoirs, which would almost without exception be the case. But um, there's probably the, the, um, the few exceptions to that, to that rule. Um, for very, very light oils, um, maybe at very high temperatures, might have a lower viscosity than some very high pressure uh, gas. Um, so, anyway, that's. Uh, I think there was a lot of important things that were that were brought out. I have my own little list of of, of items that I'll kind of give you for whatever it's worth. Um, but one of the things that I think, if you're gonna, if we're gonna try to address this question. Uh, and maybe it's a way that you should try to think about any any problem or question that you you look at as a, as an engineer, is you know what what's in common between a gas reservoir and an oil reservoir? Okay, maybe if we can figure out what's in common, we can try to figure out well what's the difference? Okay, so that's the, at least when I started thinking about coming up with an answer uh, to this question um, one, that's what I thought. So, so basically, uh, my first question would have been to myself is, what uh, is common between, I'll just call it gas reservoir and oil reservoir, okay? That would be the first thing. And I think what we can what we can say about either of these is that you have to have the gas or oil has to be mobile. Okay, it has to have it has to be able to flow. I mean, you could have a little residue of hydrocarbons or oil or gas with you know 98 percent water and a little bit of gas and oil in it, but but it'll never flow. So we're not interested in that in that reservoir. We're not interested in producing that reservoir because we wouldn't be able to produce it. So we need a mobile um, fluid and that fluid because it's gas or oil and we're in the petroleum department, the Institute of Petroleum Technology, that fluid that is mobile needs to mainly contain what kind of stuff? Hydrocarbons. Okay?
it needs to contain mobile hydrocarbons. Now, what are hydrocarbons? They're just compounds that have carbon and hydrogen in different amounts. It might be one carbon atom, and then it's a methane molecule, and it might have six carbon atoms, and it could be normal hexane or, or benzene. Okay? But primarily hydrocarbons, because if it's 98% if it's CO2 or 89% H2S, these are not hydrocarbons, um, there's probably not enough value to, to produce the reservoir to extract out that little bit of what might be hydrocarbon. But, so we want mobile, primarily hydrocarbon bearing, okay? So now we've kind of addressed that the gas and the oil both are mobile hydrocarbon fluids. And the reservoir part of the question, what is a gas reservoir? What is a reservoir? Well, a reservoir can be like a lake of water in English, okay? It's just basically a container of a fluid, usually a liquid, but we could say a, a container. Well, our container in this institute is a porous rock, right? So, so it's going to be a mobile hydrocarbon bearing pores in a rock. Okay? Or So the pores in the rock are, mo are hydrocarbon bearing, and the hydrocarbons are mobile. Okay, this is common, I think, to all gas reservoirs and oil reservoirs, at least those that we're going to make money from. Okay, so this is the the general definition of that would be common to both of these, and. Without exception, at least in my, you know, 40 years of experience, the pores not only contain a mobile hydrocarbon mixture, but they also contain what? With what we're going to call conate, which is the initial, what's there, what's nature given, God given, all given, whatever you want to. There's some water down there, and it's usually saline. Uh, conate water, and it's almost always brine. And brine, what that means is that it's a salty water, okay? And the salt content could be anywhere from something like in the ocean, about 30,000 parts per million salt. Um, sodium, I don't know, whatever's in salt in the ocean. Um, we actually eat it, so I should know. <laughs> um, and... Um, um, sometimes the salt content is 300,000, 10 times parts per minute. So pretty much every gas reservoir and oil reservoir in the world will, will come under this definition. Okay? Now, whether it's a low salinity water or fresh water or a high salinity water, really, I can tell you, you may not believe me or you may not understand why, this part here is not really affecting whether it's a gas reservoir or an oil reservoir, okay? It doesn't really matter. But I just mentioned that the, that the pores in the rock always contain water, okay? But in fact, this thing here, the fact that there is water, doesn't have anything to do with our question. So I'm just going to make that kind of gray or something that it's nice to know, but it's not really important. And to make the comparison, what we're going to say is that the, the, the rock and the pores and the water in this reservoir, which I call a gas reservoir, that the pores and the water and everything are identical with this reservoir over here, which I say contains an oil, all right? So the porosity, you know, 28%. If it's chalk, it might be 38%. If it's another rock, it might be 5%. But the porosity is the same. 
the water saturation is the same. The water composition is the same in A and B, but I call A a gas reservoir and B an oil reservoir, right? So now the question is, what is the difference between the gas reservoir and the oil reservoir? Now, in addition to having this as a mobile hydrocarbon bearing pores in a rock, is it, this material is found, in fact, it was, I asked my son last night <laughs> what he thought it was, um, and, because he's first year petroleum, so he's supposed to like have been, you know, breastfed with this stuff, you know, for 20 years. Um, and he also made the comment that you, when you find this, it's at a certain pressure and temperature, right? Okay, and in fact, this is very important to, at an initial pressure, temperature, and I'll include at some depth. The depth doesn't really come into play. The depth is kind of why it's at that pressure and temperature, okay? But the depth itself doesn't really matter, okay? So now, I'm saying in this reservoir, we've got a gas reservoir, and over here we've got an oil reservoir. The rocks are identical, the water content's identical, and the pressure and temperature are identical, okay? Everything is identical, but I'm calling this a gas reservoir and this an oil reservoir. So what are we left with explaining what's the difference? Hmm? So it's, it's the makeup, the makeup of how many molecules of methane do I have? How many molecules of ethane do I have? How many molecules of propane do I have? On and on and on. Okay? It's the amount, or what we call the composition, of the hydrocarbon. Okay? So it's basically, it's the, so we've got uh, C1, wait. methane, ethane, which we, this is CH4, uh, this is C2H, help me? Six. Six, thank you. You knew your chemistry. I, <laughs> I just got by in my chemistry. Okay, and then we got propane. That's something we like if we do grilling. Yeah. It's got three carbons and what? Ten? Eight. Eight, six, eight. Yeah, it's two times, two times three plus, plus two. There we go. And so forth. Um, we also have not just hydrocarbons. We do have some of the other stuff that we don't make much money off of, which would be nitrogen, uh, CO2, and H2S. These are not hydrocarbons, but they will affect whether it's a gas or an oil. Okay? Um, and so forth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a comment on here. If we've got six carbon numbers, then we, we might have a number of different um, compounds with six carbon atoms, right? In fact, let's, let's uh, just make this a little bit. When we get to four, these things look like this. Basically, you've got C connected to a C connected to a C. You got an H here, 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 and then three H's here. Okay, I'll drop the <laughs> the H's because you get you get tired. Okay, of doing it. So you got H's all around there. I'll I'll put them there, but you don't. You can just have this bond. That's that's the C three H eight. One two three four five six seven eight. Right. There's only one way to configure this, that the end carbons have three hydrogens, the middle carbon has two, and the other end has three. It's the only way you can configure it. But if you get four down here, then you got a couple of ways to do it. You can chain them together like this, and you can have three on the end, three on the end, two in the middle, like that. 
This is what we call, I think, normal C4, okay? But you can also reconfigure this as a chain of three, like that, I think. And then you can put a, a carbon off of either the above or below. It doesn't really matter, I think. Okay, and this one's got three here. This one's got, um, let's see, this has got three here. This has got three here. Uh, you need four, so you've got to have one, two, three, and you need got an H there. Okay, so is that correct? Yeah, I think I, I'm not real good at this. And they call this ISO. The the, the official name is ISO C4. Okay, these are called isomers. So if you have more ISO than normal or more normal than ISO, that might affect whether that mixture ends up being called a gas or an oil. Okay, maybe, maybe not. So it's going to have an effect on it. When you get to C5, you get just even more combinations. I don't know how many more. Does anybody know how many more combinations if you have C5 you get? How many isomers? You don't know. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Okay, but if you know, then you can tell us. Or you can look it up, you can Google it. Now, when we, but they'll also be like chained together and then some side, much like the ISO and normal C4. But um, when you get to C6, you, you have a number of ways to, to chain these together. One is just to chain them like, uh, it'd be normal C6 would be six of these guys, and then you got the three out here, two, 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 and then three out there. That's normal C6, right? And then you've got a number of other um, uh, isomers. But there's a new isomer that's very important, okay? Because its properties are radically different than these. All of these, what I've drawn here, are what we call normal alkanes or alkanes, okay? They've got basically a chain of carbons together, maybe with a couple of sticks on the, on the end. But then you get into this, when you get six, you can also have this circular or, um, they call it cyclical, I guess. Um, C, 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 something like that. Where these are, you guys are going to have to help me. He goes like, is it double bonds, all of them? No. It's every other one, right? There we go. So it's, I have an excuse. It was like 40 years ago that I, you know, did this. So that... And again, like I say, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get an A plus in my chemistry class. So, and it's being recorded. So for all the other professors of petroleum engineering to kind of chuckle at Curtis, but you know, it looks something like this. So, but you need four here. So you've got to have, uh, you've got to have one hydrogen on each of these. So now this is referred to as benzene. It's a very toxic, but useful chemical. Okay. And it's C6, H6. So you see there's only six hydrogens out there. Each carbon has one hydrogen. Okay? And its properties are radically different than normal C6. It's got a density that's like 800 and something kilograms per cubic meter versus the normal, the density uh, standard conditions of normal C6 is I don't know, 600 and something. Boils off at a different temperature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they're very different. This is referred to as an aromatic compound, and these benzene rings, I call them, can be. If you have C8, it could, I think, be a benzene ring and then two extra carbons. I don't know what that's called, but you can have all sorts of these crazy isomers. So. Anyway, this is the stuff making up the hydrocarbon mixture, okay? And we refer to not only the compounds that are there, but basically what's really important is which compounds exist in that hydrocarbon mixture and the amounts of each of those, okay? So if you have 99% methane, I can pretty much guarantee you it's going to be a gas reservoir. And if you got 5% methane, I can pretty much guarantee it's going to be oil reservoir, unless you all of a sudden say 
nitrogen is 82%. 82% nitrogen, 5% methane, and I say, well, maybe that's gas also. Okay? So the amounts and which compounds, these are compounds, compounds of generally carbon and hydrogen, but you've also got some of these non-hydrocarbons in there. And the really heavy components that make up asphaltine, what we drive the car on and stuff, they actually contain not just C and H, but they might have sulfur and oxygen and all sorts of other things there. But um, um, sometimes our mixtures in the reservoir contain mercury, small, small amounts of mercury. Okay? In addition to that, the water is always there, we said. And the water molecules will also, there's a few of the lucky water molecules will also be part of this hydrocarbon mixture. Okay? It's, it's like air, the air in the room doesn't look like it's water bearing, but you, everybody knows it has some water molecules in it, right? How do you know that? Because you see the liquid droplets on the, on the window if you get the right temperature combination, outside and inside and so forth. So there's water molecules in the air here. Likewise, there's water molecules in the hydrocarbon mixture. Okay? So I'm going to put H2O there somewhere. I'll put that up here because it's also non-hydrocarbon. H2O is also here. Generally speaking, and I think it's, it's not always the truth, but the salt compounds, the ions in the brine, generally do not partition into the gas or oil or the hydrocarbon mixture. They might, but I, not very much, very small amounts. Okay? So, so I think what I'm going to argue is that, I'm going to put this in pink. Okay? It's the hydrocarbon mixture, the amounts and which compounds are in my pores, not just that, and this is all referred to as the amounts and which compounds, we have a, a symbol for that. ZI. That's basically defined as the moles of each component I. That's this, which compounds you have. And it can be moles of component I over the total moles in the mixture. So it'll sum to one, right? I've got 80 mole percent methane. There are other ways to quantify it in terms of mass, which is also okay. That's, really, that's usually written weight fraction. That's defined as the mass of that component I over the total mass in the mixture. But I'm going to use the term ZI as kind of the the, the, the quantity of what's in, in the pore sharing with the water, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that that's the one thing that will determine if it's gas or oil. But it's not enough just to know that. But it's probably the most important thing. The second thing is, so let's, I'm running out of, okay. So this is the, the first thing that we need to know, if, whether it's gas or oil. The second thing is, I'm saying pressure and temperature, okay? And it really is both, pressure and temperature. Okay? That's the second thing you need to know. Okay?
the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about compositions in our reservoirs, moles, mass, methane, stuff like that, that you had in chemistry before, but you didn't realize uh, maybe that it was really important, okay? Now, we're going to be talking about that, and if I can convince you that does it matter or not, why does it matter? Let's put a second here. Or does it matter? Okay. If we can convince ourselves that it does matter, then us revisiting moles and mass and components and chemistry, uh, bubble points, dew points, vapor pressures, and all that stuff you've already learned earlier, and you thought, finally, I'm going to be a petroleum engineering student, and I'm going to get away from all that crap that we learned, you know, since I was like in grade school, okay? But it ends up that a lot of that stuff that you are learning, basic chemistry and stuff like that, is actually important if we can answer yes to why does it matter, does it matter, okay? And if, we, if I can convince you of that, then maybe revisiting these things will be more, make it more interesting to class, to come to class, and that you actually learn how to do mass composition conversion to molar composition and so forth and so on, okay? That's, that's what I'm trying, trying to lead up to here. So I'm going to answer the question without explaining how to differentiate between gas and oil. That will come a little bit later. But, but basically, um, whether it's, um, whether it's a, a reservoir gas or oil will de depend only on ZI within the reservoir. Okay? And well, and the initial, what we refer to, capital R initial reservoir pressure and the reservoir temperature, okay? With those three things, well, we, we need one more thing, but, um, but, but this is, basically all we need, okay, to determine whether it's a gas or oil. Um, we, do, we do have to make, with this mixture that we collect from the reservoir, um, we, need, we need to know what's referred to as its saturation pressure at the reservoir temperature, okay? We need to know its saturation pressure at the reservoir temperature. And we need to know what kind of saturation pressure it is, okay? The saturation pressure and type. By saturation type, I mean that it's either a bubble point. That means that that mixture ZI at its saturation pressure, what you mean at the saturation pressure is that a new phase shows up in town, okay? A new phase comes out of that ZI at the saturation pressure, okay? And if that new phase that appears when I reach the saturation pressure if that new phase is lighter than ZI and it's a gas and it's a bubble moves to the top, okay, then ZI is a liquid and the new kid in town, the new phase, is a gas. It's called a bubble point. A bubble appears. That means that what you have is an oil because it's creating a bubble. 
if the first thing you see at the saturation pressure is a little liquid droplet that goes down to the bottom because it's heavier, that means that the stuff we have, ZI, is a dew point. Dew means dig, which is a liquid droplet appearing. Okay? So that's a dew point. So the type is either a bubble point or dew point. And I'll just call it BP, DP. And basically, if at reservoir temperature, well, um, again, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to hold off on telling you how to how to find out is it a reservoir oil or a reservoir gas, or it could be both. Okay, it could be both reservoir gas and reservoir oil. But this is what we need to know. And its bubble point and its dew point is very strongly dependent on how much and which components you have in the mixture. Okay? Okay. This is called the symbol for that is bubble point. Um, I'm not ignoring you, I'm just secretly thinking about how to answer the question. Okay. Okay. So the question, and it's a good question, is why do we need to know the reservoir pressure? Okay. And I guess I'm going to have to just actually answer the question whether it's a reservoir gas or reservoir. Okay. This saturation pressure and type this can either be measured if we have a sample in the laboratory or it can be calculated. Okay. And if it's going to be calculated, you have to know the composition. That's the main input to the calculation. It's not the only input, but it's certainly a, a critical input. So the question is, why do we need to know the reservoir pressure? Well, we need, we need to know the reservoir temperature. You know that now because that's there. We need to know the reservoir temperature. But why do we need to know the reservoir pressure? Okay, so it's an oil reservoir if the bubble point pressure is less than or equal to the initial reservoir pressure. Okay? That's the definition. That's Okay? It's a gas reservoir if now there's two situations. The dew point is less than or equal to the reservoir pressure or that the reservoir pressure is greater than um, no, how should we put this? 
if the reservoir temperature is greater than this temperature T star, <laughs> okay, it's a special T temperature. Um, how should I put this? Pretty much any mixture you can create, certainly any hydrocarbon mixture, okay? If you take that mixture, you can pick your favorite field, Troll, Equifisk, uh, the, you know, some field in Kazakhstan, don't, don't care which one it is. You can pick any mixture you like. And if you heat it enough, okay, if you heat it enough, that mixture will not have any bubble point or dew point. It, it'll, it'll be single phase no matter what the pressure is, okay? Pressure could be 1 PSI or 10 billion PSI. There's no, that mixture doesn't split into two phases at any pressure, okay? If you go to a high enough temperature, okay? And the first temperature where that is the case, that there is no splitting into two phases, a T star. It's given a name, a very strange name. Okay? It's called the cry -condon -therm. Okay? So basically there is no gas oil split. You can't split out a new phase, a bubble or a dew. Okay? No gas oil split at any pressure. <clears throat> then we consider it a gas. Or, if the dew point that it does at reservoir, these are at reservoir temperature, at reservoir temperature, if the bubble point is less than or equal to the reservoir pressure, then it's an oil, and if it has a dew point at reservoir temperature, if that's less than or equal to the reservoir pressure, then it's a dew, then it's a gas, okay? But what happens if the bubble point or the dew point of this mixture is greater than the reservoir pressure? Okay? Then it has both gas and oil. It's both gas and oil reservoir. If the saturation pressure, which is either bubble point or dew point, we just call it saturation pressure, at reservoir temperature is greater than initial reservoir pressure. Okay. That means that that mixture splits into two phases, splits into two phases, a gas and an oil, at reservoir pressure. So basically, Z I splits into a gas and an oil at reservoir temperature and initial reservoir pressure. And if it splits into two phases, then you've got a gas and you've got an oil, so you can't call it just gas reservoir, you can't call it just oil reservoir, it's both. The troll field, which is the biggest gas field in Norway, and I think the third largest oil reservoir in Norway, about five, four or five billion barrels. Gas is about 45 TCF, which is, by the way, a big gas field. They're together in the reservoir. So if you take the total composition of the troll field at initial pressure of about 2100 PSI in the troll field, then you split it into the two phases, a gas cap, big old gas cap, and an oil, underlying oil. That's anywhere from about 5 to 30 meters thick, okay? The gas cap is, you know, 100 meters thick, I don't remember. It's, a, it's very thick. Looks like it's just a big gas reservoir. But this 5 to 30 meter thick oil at the bottom 
has an equivalent stock tank sellable oil volume of between four and five billion barrels. And I think it's the third largest in Norway. Shell, anybody heard of the oil company Shell? Yeah, they were the ones who discovered Troll and they were, um, I think, the operators. When they discovered this field and the estimates of the amount of gas, which is huge in place, they initially gave the value of the oil 5 billion barrels. They gave a value of zero to that oil in the troll field. Zero. I mean, like they said, it couldn't be produced. It was discovered before horizontal wells were being used in the industry. And this little Norwegian oil company called Norsk Kudro said, well, maybe you could try to produce the oil after all. And Gorshell and Stout Oil said, to hell with you. But the first use of a floating production operations FPSO system was built specifically to do a trial test of the troll oil with a horizontal well just to see if it could be done and of course it became a huge success they now have I think close to 100 to 150 oil producing wells in the troll field um, at one point it was the largest oil producing field in Norway so there it was an example, a very good example of the gas and oil. But the composition ZIM talk about is the total composition in the entire reservoir. Okay? So this is how you tell if it's a gas reservoir or an oil reservoir. And it's primarily linked to what is the total amount of methane, ethane, propane, etc. that nature put inside that rock, in the pores in the rock. Okay? That's the answer really to the question. And it's because of those components effect on the saturation pressure, whether it's a bubble point or a dew point or a two-phase mixture at initial pressure and temperature. That's really the answer to the question. So it means that it's dependent on basically these three things. Okay. Any questions? I'm not sure I could have given that answer in one minute, okay? Um, but basically, this is all you would have to say. It's what compounds, the amount of each compound, the initial reservoir pressure and temperature, that will determine whether it's an oil reservoir, gas reservoir, or both. Okay? So we'll stop there and then after the break we'll talk about some of the reasons for why it might be important.